So last time we talked about what? What were the two big ideas from last time? Potential temperature and potential density. And so what's the difference between the potential ones and the regular ones? Exactly. So Zihan just said it very well, which is if you, the potential temperature is the temperature you get. If you take a parcel and move it adiabatically, so conserving energy, and isentropically, so not changing the entropy to a reference level, it'll be the temperature it'll have when it gets there. Why does it change its temperature? Because the change in pressure allows it to expand or contract depending on whether you're going up or down in the water column. And that does work. And, and also, there's the equation of state. Those two together would mean that you'd expect to see changes of temperature. But you don't expect to see changes of potential temperature because it's correcting for exactly that piece. And then there's the other one, the weird one, conservative temperature, that's a little bit more accurate than potential temperature. But for our purposes, potential temperature is OK. Then there's the potential density, which is the same game, except you're doing density instead of temperature. So it's the density you get if you go from your location to a reference level. And you can figure it out by just plugging in the potential temperature and the reference level into the density equation of state. It'll give you the potential density. OK? So that's. Those are those pieces. And then the other part we talked about was the hydrostatic balance. What's the hydrostatic balance? No movement, exactly. The water's not moving. So which two forces are in balance? Gravity and the pressure gradient force. Very good. And so we're going to put those two together first today. And we're going to talk a little bit about the hydrostatic balance in the ocean where the density is relatively constant, and then the hydrostatic balance in the atmosphere, where the density varies a lot, because the upper atmosphere is very low pressure, and the lower atmosphere is much higher, and the gas is expanding and contracting. So we're going to contrast those first. Then we're going to talk a little bit about um, other forces in the force balance, and start to think about the rotation of the system. So why is rotation important for oceans? Sorry? The Coriolis force is one of the important consequences. But even simpler than that, the oceans are on a rotating planet. <laughs> so we should think about how, what that means. And the Coriolis force will be one part of that. The centrifugal, centrifugal force or centripetal acceleration will be another part of that. We'll see how those, how those affect the equations of motion. Um, but why don't we worry about rotation like right here? Like why do I, why, if I throw this eraser on there, why did I not have to worry about the rotation of the planet to aim that? Scale is small. The time scale is really fast. Really fast compared to what? Rotation of the Earth. So if I did this and it took a month for it to arrive over there, because I was just operating in like a viscous fluid or something, then I would ha actually have had to worry about the Coriolis force. So the time scale of motion versus the time scale of the rotation of the Earth, which is what? What's the time scale for the rotation of the Earth? A day. There we go. Yeah, good. So if the motion is slower than 24 hours, the rotation becomes important. So remember way back when, when we said, what is oceanography? Oceanography is the thing that goes from like the, ba the scale of the Earth down to a scale of like 100 kilometers or so. And it's the thing that goes from time scales slower, slow enough that the rotation of the Earth matters, up to the age of the Earth. 
So it's on that side. So traditionally, oceanography is focused more on the, on the system when you, the rotation of the planet is fast compared to the rotation of the fluid relative to the planet. So we'll get more specific about that, but there's a very, that's going to be the key concept to get started thinking about when rotation is important. And we tend to be, in almost all of the discussions we're going to have, in the limit of rapid rotation, which doesn't mean that the, ro that the day gets faster. It means that the motion is slow relative to the day. OK? All right, so let's, so, oh, so we talked about these. Can somebody explain one side of these? This is the temperature and potential temperature profile on that side, and the temperature density, the in situ density, and the potential density on this side. So it, that's on the left, and if we have the stuff that shows um, higher, uh, deeper layers, but if it were to have been raised up to the higher levels, it would have actually <coughs> had a higher temperature, so it's just not a higher potential temperature. Exactly. So it looks like this is unstably stratified in the in situ temperature, but because of the expression, the cooling with expansion and the warming with compression, that's an illusion. The potential temperature is easier to tell us about whether something is stably stratified or not. And what's our parameter of the amount of stratification? N. So what's it called? It's buoyancy. The buoyancy frequency, yeah. The buoyancy frequency or the brunt weissel frequency. And that's basically just the slope of the, of, well, potential density stratification. So the slope of that is proportional to the buoyancy frequency squared. And why do we like it as a frequency? What kind of, it was a frequency of what kind of motion? Oscillations in the water column. So if you push down a water parcel, it would bounce up and down as a form of internal wave. And the frequency, if you push it purely vertically, the frequency would have been that Brunweisler or buoyancy frequency that oscillated there. And we actually will look at some maps of that. People were asking about the numbers. Wunsch gives a nice set of maps of what that's like. And so we're going to stare at those for a minute and get a handle on how big the numbers are. OK. But let's do a little calculation first to think about how hydrostatic pressure works. So we said the pressure is the weight per unit area of the stuff above me. So go up high, high, high in the atmosphere, like in space, how much does the weight of the atmosphere above you, how much does it weigh? Nothing, right? There isn't any atmosphere above you, you're in space, that's kind of what space is. So as we go down in the atmosphere, what happens to the density of the air? It's increasing. And what happens to the pressure? It's, it's also increasing. OK, so we, this is our hydrostatic relation. This is the pressure gradient force in the vertical. And this is the density. And this is the acceleration of gravity. This isn't quite accurate enough to do the real space problem because gravity isn't constant when you get really far away from the planet. And you have to be a little bit careful about what direction z is. But let's just understand this equation by making a simplified atmosphere. So we have the ideal gas law. Does everybody know this from chemistry? So sometimes it's written as pressure times volume equals um, density in, or nRT. RT is the con R is the constant that is about the kind of gas it is. T is the temperature, and N is the number. But in this version, the volume has been brought over, so the number is replaced by density, and um, M is the mass per mole. Okay. So has everybody seen this form, or do you believe that this is a form of the ideal gas law? OK, how, much, how does the temperature vary in the atmosphere? It depends on the 
depends on the layers a lot. Oh man, that's gotta be a really complicated problem. Let's take advantage of our new understanding of potential temperature. In the troposphere anyway, there's a lot of convection. Stuff is going from the ground up to the tropopause and back. What kind of distribution of potential temperature would you think would arise if you just went up and down and up and down and up and down all the time? It's kind of like mixing it up. And would mixing tend to eliminate gradients or strengthen them? Eliminate. So in a very rough approximation, at least the troposphere and the boundary layer of the atmosphere would be constant in potential temperature. That's a little bit too hard because this is not the equation, the ideal gas law with potential temperature, and this is the one with the real temperature, and we're still a little bit far away. But for a simple approximation, let's just assume that the atmosphere has the same temperature all the way top to bottom. And let's figure out what the relationship then is in the other state variable. So here's R, which is just a constant, <laughs> which that's the number, it's in crazy units. M is the molar mass. So this is the molar mass for all the constituents of air. What's the main constituent of air? Nitrogen. nitrogen. So you could take this as just the nitrogen one, that would be fine, because 80% of air is nitrogen. Okay, so what then does this say? We need to know rho G for this equation. So if I multiply this by G and move RT to the other side, Rho G is just the pressure times Mg over Rt. And if we take the temperature to be constant, that whole thing is a constant. We know all the pieces in there. Does that make sense? I mean, they're complicated pieces, but we could just plug them in. Which then says that Rho G is proportional to P. So as we go from zero density up to whatever density we get to, the pressure is going to be proportional to the density. So is the pressure high or low in space? Low. Well, zero, just like the density is zero. And at the, at, at the surface, we don't, in, without plugging it in, we don't know what the proportionality is, but we know that as one increases, so does the other. Everybody on board with that? Okay, so let's just write this in this way. Rho G equals pressure over some scale height, which we know that it's going to have units of height in a second, but it's basically plugging in all these guys and pulling them together, it ends up having the units of length. So I have a big H on it. Okay, if we take this and plug it into that equation, what do we get? The PDZ equals minus P over H. And H is a constant. The temperature is a constant. So DPDZ is equal to minus P times a constant. What's the solution to that kind of differential equation? Something who's pro proportional to its derivative. An exponential function. So if we have this kind of differential equation, that's the solution. It's an exponential. And because of this minus sign, it's a decaying exponential. So <coughs> the pressure decreases exponentially from the surface up, 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 up. So every time we go another h up, we lose a factor of e in pressure, which is like, you know, whatever, almost a factor of three. Okay? And h, if you plug in all those numbers, turns out to be about eight kilometers. So from atmospheric pressure, one bar, we go up eight kilometers, we drop by a power of e. We go up 16 kilometers, we drop by two powers of e. We go up 24 kilometers, we drop by three powers of E, and so on. What's happening to the density as we're going up? It's decreasing, and how does it decrease? Exponential. Also exponential, because it's proportional to P. So we can calculate that the density is also dropping off with the same E folding scale. Okay, so the density is changing exponentially, so is the pressure. That's what an ideal gas does in the hydrostatic balance with an isothermal atmosphere. Okay, so what's different in the ocean? Yeah. Sorry, how do you get the exponential? Uh, from here to there? Yeah, from here to there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the easy way to do it is to go backwards and plug this in and convince yourself that it solves that equation. 
So if we put this in for p, we get this on that side divided by h of t with a minus sign. And on this side, we take the z derivative of this thing. h is constant, p naught is constant. And d dz of this is minus h times the original one, which is the same as that sign. So you can formally do the forward version of solving the differential equation, but it is much easier to go the other way and just guess and check. And if you've seen this kind of differential equation before, you'd be tempted to guess an exponential, and then you just play with the parameters until it cancels that out and solves that equation. Okay? All right. So here we go. What's going to be different in the ocean? It's not an ideal gas. What is it instead? A liquid. And a liquid is different from a gas how? Doesn't like to compress. In fact, we had a special law that we pulled out of the conservation of mass, which was called what? Incompressibility. Incompressibility. So we could just assume that it doesn't compress at all. If it doesn't compress at all, what does that say about the density? The density is a constant. So let's do this again, but instead of using this little bit of arithmetic, let's assume the density is just one value. Okay, <coughs> same hydrostatic relation. But now density is not going to be a function of pressure. Density is just going to be some constant. Okay, how do we solve this differential equation? You, can, <laughs> you just integrate which is the same as multiplying by z in the sun. So then we can say the pressure is rho naught dz plus a constant, and we can set that constant to zero at z equals zero, wherever we decide z equals zero is. And now look at the pressure. This is, how does that depend on z? It's linear. It's not exponential anymore. Totally different dependence. And if you plug in the numbers of rho naught g using 1,000 kilos per cubic meter for the basic background density of water, and g being about 10 meters per second squared. This turns out to be one decibar per meter, or one bar per 10 meters, and a bar is about an atmosphere of pressure per 10 meters, so we talked that through last time. Every 10 meters of water, you get another atmosphere of pressure because of what those units are. And this says it's just linear as you go down. The more and more negative Z gets, the higher the pressure gets, and it goes up linearly. So it's, and then here's a whole other crazy way. So this is, these are units which are convenient to remember because the answer is one, but actually nobody knows what a decibar is. So. <laughs> in SI units, it's 10 to the fourth pascals per meter, which is the same as 10 to the fourth newtons per meter cubed, or the same as 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed times 10 meters per second squared, which is this. Okay? <coughs> All right. Okay. All right, so there's a little bit of complicated stuff that I'm not going to talk about today because I want to get us on to starting to talk about rotation. But we have the equations of motion and they've got density in them in lots of different ways. There's density in the equation of conservation of mass and we said, oh, let's just do incompressibility and then let the density vary a little. But the density also appears, like on the gravity term, it also appears in the pressure relation. It also appears in those hydrostatic parts in kind of a complicated way. There is an approximation called the Boussinesq approximation that says let's pretend we're oceanic or pretend we're liquid and just take only the smallest perturbations in density around the background value and let everything else be a constant. So basically if the density is inside a derivative, then you pay attention to where it changes. If the density is multiplying something, you just use the background value. And you can go through and that simplifies the equations. The echo model we're using is actually a Boussinesq model. It makes this approximation. And that's, remember we talked a little about the conservation of volume versus the conservation of mass. We started to hint that it makes sea level rise complicated, things like that. 
we'll keep coming back to this concept over and over again, but it's closely related to this idea that the density is almost constant in the ocean. It only varies a little. And just following that through in the equations of motion. Okay. Oh. <laughs> we can do one more differential equation. Remember we had this little ball of stuff, the parcel, and we lifted it up and we thought it would bounce back and up and down with the brunt weissel frequency? If we take our equation of motion, remember we had this part was the hydrostatic part, and we don't throw away the rate of change of w with time. But we said this was small before, but what if this is the same size as that? You can follow through the machinery and show that the deviation in z of that little parcel oscillates with the frequency n squared. So this is another straightforward piece. We talked it through intellectually, <laughs> like heuristically last time, but this is the math that supports that. So this is a nice piece, and we'll come back to this as we talk more about waves and we start to think of this kind of oscillation. We're gonna think about a lot of different kinds of oscillations, but this was one that we talked about. <coughs> okay, so let's look at some maps of the buoyancy frequency. So the buoyancy frequency is the frequency of that oscillation, and it's also the stratification in what? The rate of change of z of what quantity? Potential density. So this is like how much lighter the stuff at the surface is than the stuff below in terms of potential density, so including that compressibility effect if you were to actually relocate. Okay, and last time I said that the numbers were ballpark one to 10 cycles per hour. And can everybody see where one is on this figure? One is there, and it goes up. So at the surface, it's bigger than one. <laughs> it's bigger, like four is there, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> so it's kind of one and a half to one in the upper thousand meters where the stratification is pretty high, outside of the, the upper mixed layer anyway. And then it's lower, like order a half, down here, in, or even smaller, in the interior of the ocean. So that profile that goes like this, and then rolled off of potential density, that steep part, the picnic line, is order one to 10, in terms of buoyancy frequency, and then the abyss is still stratified, but it's a more weakly stratified by a factor of two to So if I took this parcel and lifted it up, how long would it take it to s come down, cycle past, and then come back to where I had originally, or let, where I let go of it? <coughs> For this, what? An hour, because it's one cycle per hour. So it would cycle from where you let go back up to where it was once per hour. Okay. And how many times per day would it cycle? 24 times. So stratification and rotation together are two parameters that are describing the state of our fluid. And in this case, the stratification time scale is faster than the rotation time scale. So that's going to continue to be true. We'll keep thinking about those two concepts as we go along. And it's not constant from place to place. These are maps from the ECHO model um, showing the buoyancy frequency, in, again, in cycles per hour. So 2 to 12. This is near surface. This is 117 and a half meters. <laughs> um, so you can see it's higher um, along the equator. It's a little bit lower off. And then it's quite low down here and up in the Arctic, quite low being two cycles per hour. Um, where we are, it's kind of six cycles per hour. So once every 10 minutes, we'd expect those internal waves to go up and down off the shore here. If we go deeper, it gets a little bit less stratified, and now we're talking between a half and two, and this is at 850 meters. And then if we go down to 3,500 meters, we're now looking at a half to a tenth. Cycle per hour. Okay, so 
we have this simple idea of pressure being linear, and it, but it starts somewhere and then goes up. Where do you start counting the pressure in the ocean? At the surface. So is the surface flat? Not exactly, or not in the important way. The important way is, is the surface flat to an equal potential surface of the gravity field. So if you were, if you put a marble on a surface and this, that surface was exactly flat with respect to how gravity cares about it, and also we'll see if the rotation of the planet will add to that a little bit too, the marble wouldn't move, you could just put it anywhere. But if you had it tipped a little bit, it could roll downhill. That rolling downhill implies that there's a, look, there's a potential to gain energy by going in one direction or the other. So the surface of the ocean, if the oceans were not moving, would eventually level out to be totally flat with that surface, because then there'd be no energy for it to move or do anything. The oceans are in motion, so they do not reach that surface. They are a little deviation away. And that little deviation is really important because it means that the pressure field deviates along with it. I'll explain it in a second. But let's just look at a map of it and see what the units are. So this is the 16 year time average elevation of the ocean surface relative to the geoid. So the geoid is that level surface in terms of gravity. In meters from a global state estimate. So here we are, uh, if we were on the seaward side of the Gulf Stream, we'd be about a meter higher than we are in Rhode Island. So to go out across the Gulf Stream, you have to go up about a meter, okay? If we go up here to the, the entrance of the Labrador Sea, we go down about a meter. And the middle of the Pacific is raised up about a meter. The Southern Ocean is down more than a meter, almost two meters. Okay, so let's think about what that means for the pressure. We have our equation, dp dc equals minus rho naught g, if we were just taking the constant density case. So we said that that's the pressure equals minus rho naught g z, where the pressure is zero, or atmospheric pressure when z equals zero, which is the surface of the ocean. But if the surface of the ocean isn't the same place everywhere, we need to have a correction. So z as a deviation away from the local surface height. Sorry, I'm imagining that z is negative going down into the ocean, so eta is a little, eta is like this. That's the surface height elevation. Okay. Eta is not a function of z, eta is just a function of, you know, space and the horizontal and time. So this is still a solution of this equation because when you differentiate this side with respect to z, what do we get with eta? So it's the same, it always satisfies this equation. But what it means essentially is when the sea surface height goes up and down, the no pressure level is different. Okay? So if I go down like just a little bit underneath the surface, underneath the geoid, this is showing me not only an anomaly in surface height, but an anomaly in pressure along the geoid. So I'm getting like a, the pressure equivalent of an extra meter of water here in the middle of those gyres in the Pacific. I'm getting like the pressure equivalent of negative couple meters of water above me down here in the Southern Ocean. Okay? Yeah. Um, how is the um, geoid origin depicted or the elevation of the ocean being measured? Are they being both. We used to just guess this. 
um, we would go backwards. We would say, suppose the deep ocean is not moving, and therefore there's no pressure deviations from place to place, and then work upwards by measuring salinity and temperature. That's a method called the geostrophic method. Turns out that doesn't work great because the deep ocean is sometimes moving, like in the southern ocean it's moving a lot, even really deep. But this is coming out of echo, so this takes all that into account because it's got the moving stuff, but it also has satellite altimetry on it. So they know about the motion of the surface and it has bottom pressure sensors and the gravity satellite, which tells you about thickening of water and relocation to the mass of water. So this is now directly measured from satellite bottom pressure sensors, from both satellite altimeter and satellite gravity to constrain this. But that's a relatively recent development that we could measure directly. You could not, GPS is not accurate enough to measure this. This is like the Gulf Stream, all right, there's a meter change, but it's over a, a hundred kilometers. So it's one part in 10 to the five in slope. The slope is really, really small. And the surface is rough because there are waves and lots of things that you'd have to average out over. In practice, it'd be very hard to measure it from a boat, but you can measure it from a satellite because it has a big footprint and you can measure exactly where the satellite is accurately. Does that make sense? And actually, in Winch's book, he talks a lot about the early days of satellite altimetry and saying that using an ocean model like this with known ocean currents was the best way to figure out what the elevation was and then you'd figure out where the satellite was relative to this mass. So they actually, so they can measure variability of the surface from satellites pretty easily but not the mean. And so they figured out where the satellites were based on using an ocean model to figure out where the surface of the ocean was and then they would figure out where they were relative to that. Now it's you can do it directly, but at the beginning it was, it was harder to do that because they didn't know exactly where the satellites were. Okay, if we go deeper down, so this is now, oh, that's not what it is, ha, never mind, skip it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're gonna keep talking about these pressure fields a lot. So this is my version of that same one and it's in weirder units because I'm imagining I'm five meters below the surface and then I go plus two or minus two depending on where I go. So I'm down below the surface. Um, look at this pressure field, and this is now a map of the velocity field from a model. What do you see in the pressure field versus the velocity field? So the, velo the big velocities here are in orange and red. Are the v biggest velocities where the pressure is high, where the pressure is low, or where the pressure is changing quickly? Where the pressure is changing quickly. So look at this current that's going fast, sitting right on top of that cluster of contours of pressure. So where the pressure is going from high to low really fast, there's a big current sitting right on that gradient. The same is true of the Gulf Stream. Same is true of the Kuroshio. Not at all true at the equator. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. What we're going to find out is that when you are rotating, in the vertical direction, which happens everywhere on Earth except for at the equator, the gradient in pressure is closely related to the velocity. When you're at the equator, it's not, because you're not rotating in the same way at the equator. So there's some subtleties here, but this is the, this kind of piece is part of what we said for the, for the papers. Part of it was we need to think about how to, where the velocities come from. So we talked about budgets, maybe you were looking at the velocity fields and thinking about currents bringing, carrying stuff away from your region, but where those velocities come from, we don't have that description yet. So which equation are we gonna have to study to figure out the cause for a velocity? Our equations were like 
Following the temperature, potential temperature, something happens. Following the salinity, something happens. <laughs> Following the velocity, something happens. So which one, which one of those is going to tell us about where the velocity comes from? The last one. So these are the momentum equations. So we talked about the momentum equation in the hydrostatic case, but that's kind of the most boring one because that's the one where we don't, where we throw away the velocity with the hydrostatic one. Now we want to talk, start talking about the case of the momentum equation in a dynamic balance, where the velocity is not zero, but there's some other balance that comes out. All right. I think. Oh, I want to look. So all right, let's. Okay, so if we go back and look at this pressure field, the middle of these regions is high and the sides are low. So before we move away from the pressure field, we might imagine a scenario where there's a high spot in the sea surface height, there's extra water in the middle compared to the outside, and then something interesting will happen below. We're not too worried about it. But we can think of it in terms of our pillows and bricks. And so we might be tempted to take a stack of pillows that goes higher than the neighboring stack of pillows to think about the pressure as we go down. Okay, So we're going to start working towards where the pressure field underneath the sea surface high and other behavior below is coming from in terms of the hydrostatic relation. Okay. So, all right, oh, this is the one that we can't see. This is the pressure gradient equals gravity. This is the hydrostatic balance. We're going to start talking about these kind of balances, multiple of them. Fine. All right, let's think. Well, we're going to talk about rotation now. OK, so hydrostatic balance we got, we're going to think about rotation. This is a new dynamic balance for the momentum equation. This is a tank of water, which is not rotating. <laughs> it's it just water. And they squirted dye in. This is a mirror on this side, so you can see the side angle of the dye. And maybe not surprisingly, just like milk and coffee or something, it just kind of spreads out. OK. So this water is not rotating rapidly. It's just rotating with the Earth. And so relative to like the spreading rate or the velocities or diffusions involved in that, this is not a fast rotating system. How could we examine a rotating system that's similar to this? We could spin that tank, put it on like a record player, and make it go fast. OK, so this is the same experiment, except now, as you can see from John Marshall, whose arms are going around in a circle, that the tank is spinning. He's actually standing still. The tank is going around, and when he squirts the dye in, it looks really different. So how would you describe this motion compared to last time? What did it do last time? It spread out in all directions at once. It spread out in all directions kind of the same way. Here. It's streaming into these long sheets. And then if you look from the side, it's relatively uniform in the vertical. So then they're zooming in. And look, these sheets, or curtains maybe, are wobbling. And they're wobbling at a particular period related to the period of rotation of the table. So. That wobble is one phenomenon called an inertial oscillation, which we're going to talk about. And the fact that it is flowing like that is a characteristic of rapidly rotating flows, which is that they don't like to tip over and mix in 3D. They like to flow in two dimensions, along long streaks. So sometimes these are called. Um, Taylor columns, because they're like little columns of fluid moving like this. Or sometimes they're called curtains, Taylor curtains. Or you could call them Proudman pillars also. So Taylor had the idea and called them columns, but Proudman also is related to this 
understanding of this kind of flow. So whatever. So there's a story that Taylor was really interested in this. So Taylor is a, um, a physicist from the University of Cambridge in the UK. And he saw this in the tank, and he was really excited about this and thought it'd be cool. And if you put a little blah, a little block, changing the depth, the flow doesn't want to go on and off of that block. Instead, it avoids it because we'll see there's a hindrance to that. So the claim is is that he put goldfish in the tank and spun them around, and then put food on top of the little exclusion area to see what they would do. And they would not go in there to get the food. They would eat the food elsewhere, but they wouldn't swim in. So this, whether you are seeing this from like the perspective of die or even sentient beings rotating around, this rotation is a real effect. It changes the nature of fluid flow. So in the oceans, when our motions are slow compared to the rotation of the planet, we're going to expect to see a dramatic and leading order change in the fluid dynamics. Okay? So it's like the critical piece of what we need to learn to think about how the oceans are going to move. So while I'm switching over, are there any questions on that? Or you're just excited to see more things? Okay. The rotating momentum equation. So oh, I substituted last year, or <laughs> two years ago, by my grad student, Chamber, who's no longer here. But he did a very good, nice job. So some of these slides have been approved by him. So anyway, you will see. All right. So there's a bunch of stuff in lunch. And I'm actually going to find, for next time, I'm going to put some of the pieces in the, in the, um, the little book, the Ocean Circulation book. Um, I'll point you to a couple of things, because some of the schematics there are really useful to help, help think about the way the force balances are working. So next time, I'll have some other reading outside of lunch chapter three, which we've been hammering on for like two weeks. All right, so here's our hydrostatic balance. Here's our non-rotating tank. Here's our rotating tank. <laughs> so let's look at the momentum equation and start to think about it a little. OK, so the DDT, big DDT, of velocity, if we break it up as a partial derivative of velocity and a v dot grad v. This is really complicated. All right. How do we think about the directions that are in there? Which V is pointing in which direction? Let's, let me just write out the terms on that. Because I guarantee that at some point during the semester, you're going to try and write that down. And you're going to get really confused about which direction is which. OK. We talked about the vertical equation of motion once. So remember, we usually think of the velocity vector as having a u component in the x direction, a v component in the y direction, and a w component in the vertical direction. So that's so. How many equations is this for components? It's three different ones. Right? There's one for the U component. There's another equation for the V component. There's another equation for the W component. Let's just write the W component out. Could have been any other ones, but let's just write the W. OK, so dW dt is telling us this first one. OK, what direction is which in here? What's the gradient? The del operator is like a ddx in the x component, a ddy in the y component, a ddz in the z component. Let's just remind from you. All right. Del equals ddx in the x component, ddy in the y component, ddz in the z component. So what does V the vector dotted into gradient the vector operator acting on the vector V look like in the W equation?
Let's pull it apart. What does V dotted into gradient look like? Dotted into tau look like. It's change that velocity. Right? So it's going to be <coughs> U velocity dotted into what? Partial with respect to x plus v velocity partial with respect to y plus w <coughs> velocity partial with respect to z. Okay, that's the v dot grad part. What about this? It's w. Why is it w? It's the same direction as this one, whatever that direction was. So this thing is not actually a scalar, but it kind of looks like a scalar. It, it'll be the same in every equation, in the u equation, the v equation, the w equation. You would always have a u d d x, v d d y, w d d z. But this guy is going to match that one. And let's write the v equation just below so that you can see what it looks like. So this one is the same as the in inner piece, the argument of that thing. And the operator, v dot grad, is the same in every equation. Okay? Yeah. Is that the same thing as writing like the partial derivative of each of those things as a component times w? Or are you specifically thinking of the partial of x with respect to w? Or would it be like partial of x with respect to u? Or the same thing? Oh, so this is always the partial. The w is a function of x, y, z, and time. So this is the partial of w with respect to x times u. Okay. And this is the y derivative of w times v. So in these partials, you're always keeping the other partials fixed. So it's v d x keeping t, y, and z fixed, or d d y keeping x, t, and z fixed, or d d z keeping y, x, and t fixed. And the derivative only acts that way, so this velocity is not acted on by the derivative, it's outside. Although we can bring the u and v and w inside if we want to because of incompressibility. But then it gets really complicated because then we've got a product of two velocities in different directions inside. That's called the Reynolds stress or the velocity covariance. And it's kind of an odd, complicated object. It's a little easier to think of this as the material derivative acting on each component of the velocity. Okay? Everybody's got it. Okay, that's this side of the equation. What's this? This is the pressure gradient for us. And there's a Density downstairs, if we brought the density up and put it here and here and here and then br use the, uh, the conservation of mass to bring it inside, it would be clear that this would be momentum. This would be rho times v, and this would be rho times v here, and this would be pressure, which has units of mass and stuff. So the mass that's in the pressure cancels out with the mass here. So even though this is written with an F, it's actually an acceleration, not a force. The density has been divided. Okay? So here's the rate of change in momentum, and it's the material derivative, so what does that mean? Rate of change in momentum. Now the other one. So material derivative is the, is the derivative following the motion of the fluid. So this is like, if we're riding along on a water parcel, this is the rate of change of momentum of that water parcel. Okay? This one, if we throw that away, is in a fixed location. And this one is, in the Eulerian frame, carrying new water in to replace the old water from the side. Okay? So in the fixed frame, this is advecting into the domain, and this is the rate of change at your fixed location 
but these two together are following the motion of the fluid, the rate of change is velocity. Okay, pressure gradient force fixed in space, which is a little complicated, but that's what that, that is. This is the partial derivatives of pressure everywhere, and then the force being applied to that everywhere in space. Okay, so all this is, this, these two together are force, pressure gradient force plus the rest of the forces, and this is the acceleration. It's the acceleration of a fluid parcel, but it's the vector acceleration. So this is just Newton's second law, re-expressed for all of the motions of the fluid everywhere in space. Okay. So where does Newton's, I can even come back from this. When do we expect Newton's second law to work? <coughs> That's in a special coordinate system, which we almost always forget because we're normally not worried about this, but today we are worried about it. So like if you're in an elevator, does Newton's second law work relative to the elevator? Yes. yes, except for when the elevator starts or stops moving. That's like the kid's trip. When the, when the elevator gets to the top, you jump and you go really high relative to the elevator. Because while you're up, the elevator's decelerating. So from the frame of reference of the elevator, Newton's second law doesn't actually apply. The, forces are not, the force of gravity is changing in time. It's not really the force of gravity that's changing in time. It's the reference frame changing in time. What kind of reference frame are the kind we have to worry about? The reference frame, if the reference frame is, is at rest, do we have to worry about these problems? No. If the reference frame, this is the tricky one, is traveling at a constant rate of speed. Do we have to worry about this? No, that's special relativity, right? Yep, it doesn't matter what speed you're traveling as long as you're traveling at constant speed. So when do we have to worry about the reference frame? When the reference frame is accelerating. When the reference frame is accelerating, so it, it, we normally say in an inertial frame, which means a frame that doesn't have any fictitious forces, not inertial. <laughs> so it is a form, when you don't have accelerations of the reference frame, an inertial frame, then Newton's second law applies. Yeah. So then what about Earth's rotation? So the Earth's rotation. Rotation, rotation is one form of acceleration. You're always accelerating inward, and so it is not an inertial frame. And so if we want to understand the forces in the frame of reference of the Earth, we are going to have to transform to a, an inertial coordinate frame, which is a rotating one, okay? And in first year physics, they will tell you that those are not real forces, that they are fictitious, and all you have to do is get to the right reference frame and then they go away. Why, thinking about the Earth, why is that a little bit complicated? How fast is the solid Earth moving? Rotating around its own axis or around the sun? Around its own axis. Every 24 hours? Every 24 hours it goes about 40,000 kilometers. So it's going around over 1,000 kilometers an hour. How fast is ocean water moving relative to the surface of the Earth? Like maybe a, a meter, <laughs> a second, but like a, a thousandth, a ten thousandth, a hundred thousandth of that motion. So the motion we're trying to describe is a tiny relative perturbation on the frame of reference of the Earth. The, so we, it would be complicated to step out into the frame of reference of the stars and deal with that because then we'd have this background spinning, 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 and that would dominate everything, and then we'd be looking for a tiny correction to that. So that's one reason why we don't use 
the inertial frame of reference outside of the Earth. The other reason is that not only the ocean is going around, but the continents are going around like that. So the boundaries of our ocean are moving. So we can't even say, well, let's have velocity go to zero at the, at the edge of the ocean. It doesn't. It goes to whatever crazy speed and velocity, which is changing and accelerating in direction, that the continents are going in. So while you can do it, the simpler way to do it is to move into the frame of reference of the Earth, but then we have to handle the fictitious forces that come along with that, okay? So, here is a rotating frame of reference. So, we have one coordinate system like this, and, and this is the rotation axis, so this would go, say, through the north pole of the Earth or through the center of that tank in the fluid experiment, and then, in time, you can imagine another coordinate system rotating around it. Being with this angle lambda that's spreading it out, this other angle theta that's measuring the distance up away from this flat plane. Um, and there is, for any vector that you have in either coordinate system, there's also a perpendicular vector which goes from the rotation axis out to it. So if this was, say, the, the distance from the center of the Earth, this would be a smaller distance, which is the distance from the rotation axis of the Earth. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So how fast, if this is rotating with an angular, an, a, an angular frequency omega? So angular frequencies are a crazy thing. But it's basically 2 pi per period. So you go around 2 pi in radians per 24 hours on the Earth. So this guy has the magnitude of 2 pi per day. Okay? And it's oriented in such a way that it's right in the rotation axis. And then furthermore, people like to use the right hand rule, which means if you take your right hand and curve your fingers around, then it'll be positive when it's rotating that way and negative when it's rotating that way, okay? And that keeps track of this funny operator, the cross product of this and this vector. So does everybody know how to do the cross product with the right hand rule? Does everybody know what a cross product is? Everybody's looking at me sort of mysterious. I can write, we can write it out, but everybody seems to be fine, okay. The cross product is the magnitude of those two times the sine of the angle between them. So if they are aligned, the cross product is zero. If they are perpendicular, the cross product is equal to the magnitude of those two. And furthermore, the cross product has a direction which is perpendicular to both of them. So the cross product here, omega cross C, start with your fingers pointing in the direction of omega. Bend them down in the direction of C, and it goes out in the direction your thumb is pointing. You can only use your right hand. And so that's the, that's the direction. So this pseudo vector, vector, I should, well, we don't have to worry about what pseudo, what pseudo vector, this object is pointed in that direction. Okay? And this one is important because this, if this thing is rotating around like that, how does this relate to the velocity at the moment when the thing is rotating? The, if, this, if it's located at the fixed location C, but the frame is that fixed location in the rotating frame C, which way is the velocity of that location? Tangent velocity. Which way did? How? How do I describe that velocity? Tangential. It's tangential, so it's that way. It's perpendicular to both C and omega. And if C was longer, that velocity would be longer. It would be faster, right? If C was longer, it'd have to whip around faster to get to the same place in the same amount of time. So it should be proportional to C. And if omega was faster, it would have to go faster. 
So it should be proportional to omega. So in fact, omega cross C is the velocity of the motion of something located at C. Okay? Does everyone get that, those set of steps? Okay. So now we can think about changes relative to that. So if omega cross C is the location of a vector that's fixed in the rotating frame, rel the omega cross C is the velocity of that thing in the non-rotating frame. We can have little deviations from that. So we can imagine a deviation in C, which would have the magnitude of C, this cosine factor, and then a, a rate of change of one of the angles, and then also um, a, an orientation. The change in C is actually going to be proportional to this omega cross C dt. So the change in C in the inertial frame, the change of a vector, so if this vector is position, the change in position of that location is just going to be omega cross C. That's what we just said. Okay? So the velocity <coughs> at which it's traveling in the inertial frame is omega cross C. I prefer the intuitive way rather than this, but this is how you do it if you were just going to think of it component by component. Okay. So this is what it is for a fixed vector. If we take B, which is something that's changing in the rotating frame, we, and then we think about it in the non-rotating frame, it would have the omega cross B, which is the relationship between the rotating frame and the non-rotating frame, plus it would have whatever change it was exhibiting in the rotating frame. So you would add those two together. So C is like that. So suppose B is wiggling around C. This is the thing describing B wiggling around C. This is the part that just has to do with the rotating frame, <coughs> and that would be its rate of change in the inertial frame. Okay? So we're building up pieces here. If this were zero, if our frame was not rotating, we would be back to, doesn't matter which frame we're in, get the same answer. But if we are rotating, there's this other term proportional to the rate of rotation. Okay. So let's take one particular example. Let's think of position. So the rate of change in time of position is velocity. So the rate of change of position to time in the inertial frame, that is the velocity in the inertial frame, is equal to the rate of change with respect to time in the rotating frame plus omega cross the position. So the velocities as measured in the rotating frame differ from the velocities as measured in the inertial frame. And it's easy to think about that. If it wasn't rotating, they'd be the same. If it wasn't moving in the rotating frame, it would just be omega cross r, just like we saw for c. So we add those two together. And that's what we get for the, relative ro for the combination of relative rotation relative motion in the rotating frame and the rotation of the system. So here's the rule. In the inertial frame, a velocity is equal to the velocity in the rotating frame plus omega cross r. Is everybody on board with that? OK. <laughs> now let's <laughs> do it again. So the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. And in Newton's second law, that's what we want. We want the F equals ma. We need to know what the a is. So we need to take two time derivatives. So if we take the first one, we just showed that it was the v. If we take one time derivative, this was the answer, one time derivative of position. If we take a second time derivative of position, that is to take the time derivative of the vi and the vr, we get, so in the inertial frame, the rate of change of the velocity in the rotating frame is the rate of change in the rotating frame of the velocity in the rotating frame plus omega cross the velocity in the rotating frame. This is what we found from the first derivative. So we can 
plug in for this. So VR equals VI minus omega cross R. VR dt is okay. This one is okay. So now look at what we've got in this equation. We have things that are only knowable in the inertial frame on this side and things that are knowable in only the rotating frame on this side. So this is the acceleration as measured in the rotating frame. This is the acceleration as measured in the inertial frame plus the rate of rotation as measured in the inertial frame. Okay. And if this one is constant in time, well, if, if omega is constant in time, we can just take the ddt of the r and we can skip over that. So then we get ddt of vi in the inertial frame, ddt of this cross r gives us this guy, which we can plug in again with using the first formula. And so we're working hard, working hard, working hard. This is the one we cancel out to get. We have the rate, we have the acceleration in the rotating frame as acceleration is measured in the rotating frame is equal to the acceleration in the inertial frame as measured in the inertial frame. So this one is the one that Newton's second law talks about. This is the one that we measure on the Earth. And so to get from one to the other, we have to add this term, which is this guy plus this guy, and this term, which is this guy plus this part of this guy. Okay. So there's Coriolis force and the centrifugal force. Okay. So what this means is when we go from the forces of motion written in the inertial frame, we have to add on two new forces to express the motion relative to the rotating frame. Coriolis force and the centrifugal force. The, Coriol the centrifugal force depends on position and the rate of frame rotation. So even if you're not moving, even if you're hydrostatic, the centrifugal force is coming into play. The Coriolis force depends on the relative motion. So if you're rotating along with the planet, you don't experience any Coriolis force. You only experience Coriolis force if you're moving relative to the planet. Okay? And both of these depend on this angular frequency. So this is radians per day. So what if this is, you know, Meters per second change per second. Or this is meters. I mean, what if these are really fast? What can we say about these two terms? They're going to be small. So this one, so this one, it's, they both depend on VR. This one is the rate of change. And this one is the frame rotation. So if the rate of change is fast compared to the frame rotation, this term will be small, and basically those two will be close to each other. If this DDT is slow, slow motion, then we've got to think about these terms. So we're coming back to that same concept. So we're running out of time, but I will just write this last. OK, I'll write this last piece. There is a special thing that you can do with the centrifugal force, which is a little bit of magic. So the centrifugal force depends only on your position. Gravity depends only on your position. You can put the two together and just stick them both into what's called the geopotential gradient. And then you don't have to worry about the centrifugal force anymore. So the centrifugal force can be absorbed into the force of gravity. Why can't we do that with the Coriolis term? It depends on your velocity. So different motions will experience different centrifugal for Coriolis forces 
they will experience the same centrifugal force. So the centrifugal force is like gravity and then it's just a fixed property of the rotating frame. So we can take it in and combine it together with gravity and then we don't have to worry about it. So here is our rotating equation of motion. Here's our material derivative, which is just those guys, velocity being affected by velocity, and all of these v's now are the relative motion. These being affected by the relative motion. Centrifugal or Coriolis force, which we can put on this side and call it a force, or we can put it on this side and say it's the Coriolis acceleration. It doesn't really matter. It's a fictitious force. So we can think of it as an aspect of the frame rotation, or we can think of it as an applied force in a rotating frame. Either way. Then our pressure gradient force is unaffected by this transformation of rotation. The what used to be gravity now gains a little extra piece from the centrifugal force and then other forces that are involved in the system. So if I drop this, this is the last question. If I, if I take this and balance it, does it, where does it point? Almost, except for the centrifugal force. So this, this is actually pointing not down the gravity axis, it's pointing down this geopotential gradient. So it's actually pointing a little bit in the northern hemisphere, it's pointing a little bit north along the rotation axis of the center of the Earth, the center of mass of the Earth. It's about one in part in 300 of the way, uh, so the gravity we experience, if you're at the equator, you're a little bit lighter. You're about a third of a percent lighter because you're getting flung out by the rotation of the Earth. At the pole, you are as heavy as gravity does because you're not, experience, you're not getting flung out from the pole by the centrifugal force. So that's the meaning of this cross-crossness. If you think that through, You'll, real, you'll start to th be able to think about which direction you'll be experiencing the centrifugal force. But we can put them all together and then they kind of go away from our perspective, but this one we're gonna spend a whole semester, remainder of the semester thinking about what it means. But this one is hard. This one is relatively easy. Yeah? Is that R in the centrifugal um, part, is that the C in the diagram or C perpendicular? Yeah, so, C, we were talking about it being a constant vector that was just marking the rotating frame. It's constant in the rotating frame. R is actually your position of wherever you are. So it might be fixed in the rotating frame. It might be moving in the rotating frame. It's the position of a piece of fluid as it moves around. Because when we took its derivative, we were actually relating it to velocity of the fluid. So R is the position of a, a hunk of fluid. Whereas C is just a constant vector. And C doesn't have any DDTs. It just had the, the it just had the centrifugal force. Okay. So this is kind of a crazy derivation, but the important piece that we saw was in the tank, the rotating tank is qualitatively different from the non-rotating tank. Totally different fluid dynamics. That's why. We're going to spend a lot of time thinking about this term and how it affects the motions of fluids. And this is, you're going to come to understand this very, very intimately before the class is over. Okay? Other questions? When is Baylor going to look at my paper? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> we'll have all the pieces. We'll have all the grading back to you guys at the same time you guys are turning in your your pieces so we'll all have it back to each other. <laughs>